Chang, and this is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from this week in tech. Coming up in the next hour, Apple reports earnings that beat expectations with an upbeat forecast for the current quarter. We'll bring you all the highlights. Plus, five important words. Tesla says it will be sustainably profitable and cash flow positive by the end of the year and sets yet a higher target for the Model 3, aiming to make 6,000 cars a week by the end of the month. Still, the company managed to burn through $740 million last quarter. We'll discuss. And investor Gary Vaynerchuk is buying Facebook as investors flee. He tells us why he is still a big believer in Mark Zuckerberg ahead. Just last week, it looked like the tech sector was in for a massacre this earnings quarter thanks to a disastrous showing by Facebook. But then came Apple. The iPhone giant surged this week following its earnings report as much as 9%. And then Thursday, it happened. $1 trillion. Apple became the first U.S. publicly traded company to cross that milestone. Just how did it get there? Bloomberg's Mark Gurman has the answer. After months of waiting, it finally happened. Apple has become the first U.S. publicly traded company to hit a $1 trillion valuation, leaving the likes of Amazon, Alphabet, and Microsoft in its wake, but not far behind. Apple's milestone is significant and a testament to the rapid growth and spurred by the success of products like the iPhone and iPad, as well as CEO Tim Cook's leadership after taking over for visionary co-founder Steve Jobs in 2011. And we are calling it iPhone. But let's not forget that what's now the world's most valuable company was on the brink of bankruptcy as recently as the late 1990s. That was until co-founder Steve Jobs returned to the fold. Since then, it was one success after another. And in the seven years since Jobs' death, Cook has steered Apple to new heights by launching key new devices like the Apple Watch, iPhone X, and the AirPods. He's also pushed the company deeper into new services like Apple Music, which is now a key revenue driver. And Cook and his team aren't stopping there. They're keeping Apple on the technological edge, delving into self-driving cars, augmented reality, and healthcare. What does he think of Apple's latest milestone? Cook told Bloomberg in an interview, quote, I don't really think about it. That's the truth. I still view Apple as a pretty small company, the way that we operate. I know it's not numerically, but the way we function is very much like that, to be honest. And to grow beyond $1 trillion, Apple has to keep churning out cutting edge smartphones while still finding its next big hit and growing the digital services business. A larger version of the iPhone 10 and a cheaper model with many of the 10's features are on the way. Beyond that, AR could revolutionize personal computing once again, while a big online video push is coming soon to an Apple screen near you. One T, here to tell us more, the voice you just heard, Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman. And in London, we have Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde. And with us in Minnesota, Loop Ventures managing partner, Gene Munster. Gene, I'll start with you, given that you have come, covered this company for years. What does this actually mean? Well, I think it means that, uh, that Apple has become really the fabric of our lives. I think it's just testimony to that, that this is uh, something that we don't even think about how much we rely on Apple's devices. And uh, that means that uh, I think that's one piece of it. I think it also means that the company is so big right now, it has an unfair advantage over a lot of other companies. Just given its market cap, the stock that it has, if they ever did want to acquire companies, they've got more leverage on that. And last is, I think it is a, a wonderful reminder to people to stick to doing one or two things exceptionally well. In Apple's case, it's always really been one thing exceptionally well. And uh, Tim Cook got a lot of heat over the years for not going down in the, the phone, coming out with a cheaper phone in a mass market. And he got d distracted or criticism for not doing M&A, but he stuck to what he believed in. And I think that was kind of the third piece that I take away from hitting this milestone. I do have this chart here in my GTV library showing Apple at the top, but 
trailed by Amazon, Alphabet, Microsoft, all in a sort of a pack rising behind Apple. You know, Mark, you also make the point in your story that Tim Cook has had a lot of successes, even though he's also caught a, fl- a lot of flack for not being Steve Jobs. Right, and this is no accident. If you remember when Tim Cook took over as CEO back in the fall of 2011, there was so much talk. Is he going to be able to steer the company to new heights? Is he going to be able to do more than stabilize it? And at the same time, there was a lot of talk, hmm, is he going to let this company go? Is it going to become like the company it became under John Scully and under past CEOs who replaced Steve Jobs originally? And the answer was a resounding no. This is at a market cap that's 3x what it was when Steve Jobs passed away. And that's just a number, but the number is still representative of this historical marker that represents so many new products over the years, smaller products, the Apple Watch, etc. Now, you point out in your story that Apple isn't the first company to hit a trillion dollar market cap. In fact, it was PetroChina, which quickly fell as oil prices fell. Caroline, you've been digging into uh, some of the other historical markers here, and having the highest market cap isn't necessarily a recipe for success. It's certainly not. Just cast your mind back to Microsoft, a key tech player that back in 99 hit that half a trillion dollar mark, the $500 million. And well, it then had four successive years of, of downward trajectory. It languished at then the number 300 almost in terms of market capitalization. It doesn't always spell that this is going to be a winning streak for the company. You mentioned PetroChina. Well, because oil prices crashed, it swiftly fought, fell off its perch as well. So I think it doesn't always spell glory, but I think what's going to be taken into account when it comes to Apple is not only is it ahead of the pack when it comes to the other in excess of half a trillion dollar value company so it's about a hundred billion dollars worth more valuable than Amazon it's well ahead of Microsoft and the like and Alphabet but also its price to earnings is still pretty darn reasonable it's the lowest of those four killer tech companies is it tr- trades at about 18 times future earnings when you compare that to Amazon that's nipping at its heels it trades at more than a hundred times future earnings Earnings. This is a company that's already raking in a quarter of a trillion dollars in terms of revenue every single year. It makes money. No wonder its valuation is so high. Jane, what are the risks for Apple here? Is there any risk that Apple does hit this mark and then and then fall back down, given all the challenges ahead, even though it is still relatively cheap compared to its tech peers? So there's no immediate risk, and that always concerns me when I can't identify uh, an immediate term risk, but I don't see any immediate term over the next one to two years. There probably, over the next five to 10 years, is gonna be the emergence of wearables. And this idea that you can, it's an augmented reality first, it's something that Apple believes strongly in, but that's gonna be a shift in terms of the devices that people are gonna use. And so the good news for investors is we have a, a clean sailing ahead for the next several years, but the risk is kind of down the road relative to uh, what can happen when we have the next hardware shift. And would remind people, that's one thing that Apple has done brilliantly well, is this idea of embracing the innovator's dilemma. And what that means is when they've had successful products, 2005, the iPod was just over 50% of revenue, they were very uh, aggressive at creating a new product to cannibalize that with the iPhone in this case. In the future, Apple's going to have to cannibalize the iPhone, and that is going to present some sort of a risk to the story. Well, Mark, wearables were up 60% in in the last quarter in terms of revenue, but is it going to be the Apple Watch or AirPods that cannibalize the iPhone? Probably not. That's absolutely right. And to your point, no, it's not going to be the AirPods or the Apple Watch. It's going to be another product that, as Gene uh, alluded to, that's going to be augmented reality glasses. That is Apple's next big thing. Uh, How big can that be? Yeah, and we declared that as Apple's (laughs) next big thing about two years ago. And this is really what Tim Cook is banking the the future of the company on, to some respect, in terms of hardware. The company has well over 1,000 engineers working on this right now. They're working on an augmented reality headset that is designed to eventually succeed the iPhone it will take some of the you know the heat away from the Apple Watch not doing as well as some may have expected uh, earlier on. This is their next big product. Gene, are you as optimistic about AR as Mark is here? 
Yeah, Mark's done a wonderful job of covering the, the topic, and I wholeheartedly agree that this is kind of the next thing in terms of uh, the, the the mobile device. But uh, it's going to be a, a long time away. I would I'm very optimistic about Apple's business over the next several years. I just want to emphasize that piece because their hardware business, the iPhone business, is operating almost like a services business. But kind of putting it all together and answering your question, Emily, is that uh, I share. Uh, Mark's optimism about the future impact that augmented reality will have on consumers. And Caroline, it's not just products that have led to this run up, it's also share buybacks, correct? Certainly when it comes to the share price. I mean, there's a fascinating chart that we can show on the GTV library that really highlights how much the ramp up in share price has been driven by buybacks. They've brought back phenomenal quantities of shares, billions spent since they first announced those buyback intentions. And actually, when you do all the math, you can see that basically 42% of the share ramp up is actually because of these share buybacks. Now, that doesn't mean that the market capitalization is driven by that, because of course, when, when you buy back shares, Shares, there are less there to times by the price of them and so therefore you in some way halt your market capitalization but also you drive up your overall pro price of each and individual share particularly when you're baking in the earnings that they've been managing to have so it's a bit of a complex realization as to market cap but certainly the share price ramp up well that's been a lot to do with buybacks not just innovation Coming up, Tesla CEO Elon Musk offers a mea culpa on the earnings call Wednesday after scolding two analysts on the last call for what he called bonehead questions. We'll bring you all the highlights from Tesla's report ahead. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Staff awoke on Wednesday to surprising news. Their company is working on a search app tailored and censored for China. The company has been working on the project codenamed Dragonfly since spring of 2017. This would be an about face for Google, with, which largely withdrew from the country in 2010 when it refused to self-censor its content. The project was kept secret from all but select teams and leaders and has sparked a furious internal debate. Some good news from Tesla this week. The company burned through less cash than Wall Street feared in the second quarter and has ramped up production of its Model 3 sedan. Production hit 5,000 a week multiple times in July, and CEO Elon Musk predicts 6,000 Model 3s a week by late August. Tesla stock soared Wednesday after Musk apologized to the analysts he scolded three months earlier for asking, quote, bonehead and dry questions on the company's previous earnings call. Yeah, I'd like to apologize for... Um you know, uh, being applied on the prior call. Uh, now, honestly, I think there's really no excuse for bad manners, and I was kind of violating my own rule in that regard. Um, you know, that certainly have some I have some excuse. Uh, but, you know, there are reasons for it, and that I've gotten no sleep, and um, it, you know, I've been working sort of current or 10 hour or 20 hour weeks, but nonetheless, there's still no excuse. My uh, my apologies for for not uh, being flagged on the prior call. We spoke with Tasha Keeney of ARK Investment and Bloomberg Business Week's Max Chafkin Wednesday as the call was just beginning. We're very much looking forward to the to more news about this China factory. You know, in the letter they said China is one of the largest markets for EVs, and that's true, but it's also the largest market for autonomous driving. And we think that's the largest market opportunity ahead of Tesla. It's a $10 trillion market globally in the next 10 years. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Um, we, we, you know, we think they could raise some capital to support that, and we're okay with that. Max, you've been diving into the numbers um, for the last uh, hour or so. What else do you see? Um, 
um, that we're not looking at? Yeah, I mean, the big question for me, and, and that I don't think has been answered yet, um, we'll see what happens on the call, is is demand. Um, so, so we know that Tesla, based on what they're saying, that you know they haven't even tried to sell the cars, and 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 they're selling them really, really well. Um, we don't know what's happened with these hundreds of thousands of reservation holders. Um, some analysts had suggested the possibility that you know there were lots of cancellations. Tesla's kind of pushed back on that, but I think I think in the long run, um, that's going to be a big question. Like, how many people really want um, this this car? You know, famously, electric cars are a very small percentage of the um, total auto market. Um, you know, obviously, Tesla thinks that that's going to grow, and there are a lot of reasons to think it'll grow, but 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 it's unclear just how much and just how badly people want these things. And in fact, Tasha, Goldman put out a note saying that they've seen interest decrease as availability and test drives have increased. Does that concern you? You know, I, I think there's more than enough demand out there for the car. And I mean, we're, we're seeing that in the sales, right? I mean, the Model 3 sales outpassed, outpaced all midsize premium sedans. I and mean, that's pretty amazing for a new car. Um, so, so, you know, we're really not concerned on the demand side. And we've seen really great resale values from these vehicles as well. So if you look at a Model S, it sells for $75,000. Four years later, it's worth 45000 I mean, that's 10000 more than a comparable BMW. Um, so, so we think these cars are a great investment. Uh, you know, we think once they go autonomous, you can actually make money off of them. Um, we're really not concerned from the demand side. Still, Max, the bears, of course, are out there. Uh, David Einhorn shorting Tesla. Uh, Elon Musk uh, not so happy about it. In fact, responded to uh, a report from Bloomberg's TikTok um, saying to Einhorn specifically, tragic. We'll send Einhorn a box of short shorts to comfort him through this difficult time. As always, punchy. I think this is uh, this is the Elon that investors want to see because, like I said, you know he's a happy warrior. Yeah, he's, he's punchy, but he's he's at least sort of rolling with it. Because in that report, um, Einhorn was complaining about the quality of his of his car and saying he wasn't going to cancel. He was going to cancel his lease. So the fact that Musk is sort of taking it as a joke, that's probably going to be seen as a, as a good sign from uh, from investors. Uh, Musk has opened the call with a number of other Tesla executives thanking them for their, quote, mind-blowing performance over the last month and confirms that they've been doing 7,000 total cars weekly into July. Um, Tasha, obviously the numbers are, are moving in the right direction. Do you think that it's sustainable even without that tent and, and the human production line outside? You know, I think I think Tesla's really working hard on that sustainability um, aspect of it. I, I think you know we, we they said that they hit five thousand multiple times. Of course, people are looking for that to be continuous. Um, but you know, to take a step back, um, I think there's a lot of undue focus on these production numbers. Um, you know, people are really sort of missing this long-term story that Tesla's producing this unbelievable product that actually improves after you put it on the road. I mean, no other automaker is doing that right now. These cars improve overnight. Um, um, you know, they, they, they gain value, actually, after you acquire them as a customer. Um, and that's really the Tesla advantage, the software advantage. And that's not going away anytime soon. And, and that's why they're able to attract such talent, um, you know, because they have the star figure, Elon Musk. That was Tasha Keeney of ARK Investment and Bloomberg Business Week's Max Chafkin. Still ahead, seems like selling consumers on cool tech gear just proved easier than convincing investors of it. Details on Sonos' stumble onto the public market, next. And later this hour, Square's earnings forecast fell short this week. A rare miss for the company. We'll speak with Square CFO Sarah Fryer. Shares still going up. This is Bloomberg. Uber announced it will be shutting down its self-driving truck service as it chooses to focus solely on car development. Uber acquired the self-driving truck startup Auto, led by former Waymo engineer Anthony Lewandowski in 2016, in an effort to remake freight trucking. The self-driving car service has been surrounded by controversy since following Waymo's lawsuit against Uber, claiming that Lewandowski stole trade secrets. As competition in the self-driving car industry heats up, Uber says it will move self-driving truck employees to other roles in the autonomous vehicle department. 
Meantime, shares of wireless speaker maker Sonos began trading Thursday on the Nasdaq after an underwhelming initial public offering. The company priced shares below the marketed range and raised $208 million. That gives Sonos a market value of about $1.5 billion. In April, the company was hoping for a valuation twice that size. Our Bloomberg IPO reporter Alex Barinka caught up with Sonos CEO Patrick Spence Thursday after shares began trading. It was the kind of the tech headwinds that we've seen over the last couple of days. As we got on the road, uh, it became apparent after the Facebook drop and some of the weakness that uh, you know investors were getting a little skittish. And Patrick, I hear you, but you know, Tenable last, uh, listed last week above their range, above an increase range, and the discount was more than what we've seen uh, tech stocks kind of fall out of bed. Were there certain points in the uh, in Sonos's business that investors are paying more attention to that perhaps they didn't uh, get as excited about as I know you are? Well, I think the I think the the whole roadshow was about educating investors in terms of our model, and I think the the quick reaction is always, oh, you know, they make these great sounding, great looking speakers, and so they're a hardware company. And so we did have to spend a lot of time helping investors understand that we're a totally different type of company that build products that last for a long period of time, and people come back and buy more of those products. And so we are unconventional in that sense. As far as I know, in consumer electronics, we're the only company that approaches it the way that we do. Uh, and so certainly like some of that education was necessary as we went through it. Uh, and so I think there's that element of it, uh, of course. And Patrick, when I talk to Sonos owners, they do love the product, but we all know a product does not a good business make. When you do talk about that narrative that you're pushing out to the street, where is the growth going to come from? Is it convincing folks to upgrade to new systems, uh, new speakers? Is it the platform itself? Where do you see uh, that growth in the future? Yeah, so we've really, in this first phase, you know, we've really been successful in breaking into the traditional home audio market, people that were looking for stereo systems in their home. What I'm most excited about and what our investors got excited about was the fact that there's 176 million people around the world that are now paying for streaming music. They're paying $120 a year. They love music so much. It's $149 to start with Sonos. And what our job is right now in this second phase is to really get the people that have all that great music from Spotify, Apple Music, Pandora, uh, you name it, on their phone and get them listening to it out loud at home. And that's exactly where we come in because of our open platform supporting all those services. And so that is really what we're talking about in this kind of next phase of Sonos and what I'm most excited about. Patrick, on the Roadshow, you talked a lot about uh, the opportunity that voice-activated speakers brings, and we, uh, you know, definitely pair Amazon's Alexa with uh, the the next age of voice-activated speakers. But Amazon is a partner; they're also a company that tends to strike fear into other technology companies. How do you manage that relationship going forward if they decide to push in more into the wireless speaker space? You know, we've managed the relationships with Amazon, Apple, and Google for over a decade. They've put their, you know, music services on our platform. We work very closely with them, respect all those companies. Um, we have put Alexa on the platform, as you mentioned. Google Assistant will come later this year. You know, it's been beneficial for both sides uh, in terms of them being able to get their services into our 7 million homes and us being able to offer that voice control of the music experience. So, you know, based on our experience to date in our last decade of history, I expect that all of our partners will continue to want to bring their latest and greatest service to Sonos and we'll bring that into millions of additional homes and it'll be beneficial for both sides. Uh, looking forward to the latter half of the year, you are a public company now and some of the macro trends will uh, undoubtedly impact how your sh your stock trades, whether it's tech earnings from the broader group or uh, political uh, tensions with the likes of China. What are the biggest risks for your business in the second half of 2018 when you look forward? Well, I think the, you know, I really feel, you know, after 20 years in the tech space, you know, I really feel it's much more about what you're doing and executing in your, your own business. Obviously, I realize and I'm realistic in watching things around the tariffs and uh, things like that, but it's much more where we are right now in the market with a huge opportunity in front of us. I'm much more focused in the, how we execute the products we need to bring to market, the new countries we're opening, and really attaching to all those people that are paying for streaming music. And so I feel like at our size and scale, some of those macro trends uh, we'll watch and be mindful of, but mm -hmm. it's also the opportunity ahead is so big and we're so early in the game that a lot of those um, I think we can maneuver around. Bloomberg's Alex Barica there speaking with Sonos CEO Patrick Spence.
Coming up, he's a big backer of Facebook, and despite its last quarter, Vaynerchuk Media CEO Gary Vaynerchuk is only buying more. That's next. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology, and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Has Facebook hit bottom or does it have farther to fall? Social Network's second quarter results showed signs it may be running out of new users. Investors reacted swiftly, wiping $100 billion in market value off the stock. But one person who's not worried? Investor Gary Vaynerchuk. Here's what he had to say when one Twitter user asked him about Facebook's drop last week. I've bought the stock today. That's my thoughts. We sat down with Gary Vaynerchuk, VaynerMedia CEO, for a wide-ranging interview that began with what else but Facebook. I bought a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of shares. I'm, I bought some more this morning uh, because I'm a long-term believer in the stock and I don't think there's going to be a lot of moments over the next three to four years uh, outside of macroeconomics that I'm going to be able to take advantage of it. Uh, you know, I'm, I don't tend to buy a lot of publicly traded stocks. My original Facebook came pre-IPO, but when it got hit when all the Cambridge Analytica stuff happened and Mark was on uh, trial, I, I bought a ton. Uh, and then obviously off the, this missing numbers or news uh, recently, I've been buying up a little bit more, mainly because I think in the next four, seven, nine, 13, 26 years, it's a good buy. So it's interesting, that, and that is a big bet. Roger McNamee, early Facebook investor, who I'm sure you know has been out there very publicly critical of Facebook, he compared Facebook to Philip Morris to me in terms of hmm. Facebook's negative impact on the world. What about concerns about fake news? What about online hate? What about concerns about our privacy? I, I think there is a stunning non-conversation about uh, taking on some sense of responsibility, meaning Sure, but choosing CNN or Fox or MSNBC has as many dynamics as what you're seeing in your feed and then more importantly, what you're choosing to uh, consume as real. I mean, to me, the thought that Facebook is any different than Twitter or Instagram, which obviously they own, or websites or you know, a million different ways we consume is is kind of laughable and silly. I mean, Visa and Target and the American government itself has had breaches of information far more dramatic. And so, you know, yeah, I mean, I understand the concept, uh, but I think making, you know, making a jump from Philip Morris, which systematically spent lobbying dollars and, and tried to pay off politicians for four to five decades to suppress information is an awfully big jump by that person. Okay, but what about profitability versus privacy? Will one always trump the, the other? And can we actually trust Facebook? I mean, tr you know, I, I, I have no problem trusting Facebook any more than I trust any other company on earth. Uh, profitability and privacy is kind of funny to me. We choose to do convenience over profitability every day of the week and privacy. I mean, the way we pick privacy uh, at, on a pedestal is almost non-existent in our actions. Every person watching this right now gives up privacy every day for convenience and speed. And so whether it's gonna be Amazon or Google or Apple or Facebook or any of these companies that sit as a layer on top of the internet, we have shown through our actions over the last 30 years uh, and, and, and continue to with the usage of Instagram and others. I love all the people protesting Facebook on Instagram. We prove as humans all the time how we think about privacy, which is we love to talk about it, but we don't fear it as much because the underlining issue is the amount of bad things that happen to the health and well-being of our family or having our money stolen is extremely far and you between. What about the forces that may be bigger than us? The fact that Russia tried to hack our elections using Facebook and that there's evidence that they're doing it again to sow discord. I don't, Has I don't, Facebook done enough Emily, to I prevent itself from being sure. weaponized? It, Facebook, I mean, look, Facebook, this network, Fox, CNN, Twitter, it's all the same game where I think about it from a macro, which is 
we make decisions. Facebook or the Russians didn't make us pull for Trump or Hillary. And so I think that the information that people are buying ads and running them in our streams is very interesting because if you look at the execution of people that run political ads, the cost of penetrating somebody with a different opinion versus one that already reinforces your stance is where this starts getting far more interesting. You know, I, I'm, I think this is one of the great examples in human time of us not interested in accountability. Facebook didn't make you a racist, you made yourself a racist. So let's talk about Twitter. Sure. Because you know you use Twitter a lot, we saw the same huge dip on the back of Twitter earnings and it's, it's very clear that Twitter it's just not in a high growth state. They've hit a plateau. Yep. In fact, they actually lost users over yep. the last quarter. Yep. The influence is there. The president of the United States is using yep. it as his megaphone, and, but and, it's, it's and, not the next Facebook. Yeah, no, but it was never the next Facebook. And like, you know, the truth is, Facebook is all encompassing, right? With Instagram and who knows what Mark and Cheryl and the team is up to on their next M&A or innovation. You got WhatsApp. Yes, it is not the next Facebook. I assume it's not priced on Wall Street in the same manner. I will say this, if you look very closely to Moon Pie, which is a small snack brand, if you look at what Wendy's is doing, I will say that the business world is starting to understand how to use Facebook to drive business. Uh, we're working with Kraft Heinz on Miracle Whip. It stuns me how much Facebook, excuse me, Twitter is the backbone of driving sales at Albertsons and Walmart. So I will say that maybe the the whiff of attention on Twitter is not growing to a stock market's want and needs, but the depth of attention in the platform and the ways to maneuver in it and its ad product. I've been, over the last three to four years, quite critical and not excited about Twitter uh, publicly but I no question have seen over the last six to 12 months uh, a resurgence different than let's say the Trump effect of just how much attention is in the platform. And when you have attention, I think you have the ultimate currency. You know, to me, it'll be interesting to see what they do with their OTT. I think they should play in that space. I think they were flirting with that a year or two ago. Again, you know, I don't know how earnings are done or how much the street values things, but I will say depth, maybe not width, is uh, emerging on Twitter. The top five companies by market cap are Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, Microsoft. In 2007, just before the financial crisis, one of them was a tech company, and that was Microsoft. Is the market put, putting too many eggs oh. in the tech basket? Yeah, I mean, look, honestly, and I want to be very fair for the audience, I think about things in such long term, like the thought of me understanding the short term economics of 90 day terms and numbers that most of the viewers here play on and the arbitrary nature and just the fact that we're playing financial engineering, not actually building businesses. In the macro, of course not. We're not going backwards. Tech companies will continue to gain momentum. Let me pull it out right here. This is where we actually live, not here. And so in the super long term, no. Uh, in the short term, I have no sense if the market has overpriced these companies based on what the numbers that they can hit over the next 90 days. But like, people aren't going to be watching ABC and NBC over Netflix, right? People are not going to be consuming newspapers over Facebook. Like, that is only going to, we're just starting in that world. Short term economics and the way the street likes to play, that's up to all of you guys. But the danger in a 5, 10, 15 year macro, I don't see it because, you know, the reality is is we're only heading in one direction, which is technology doesn't care about our feelings or our short-term judgment or Wall Street. It just continues to advance and humans are engaging deeper and deeper and deeper and will continue to in perpetuity. That was VaynerMedia CEO Gary Vaynerchuk. Coming up, Square stock has doubled this year, but spending on new businesses and growth is tempering profit. Are investors expecting too much? Our interview with Square CFO Sarah Fryer is next. This is Bloomberg.
When it comes to Square, investors expect a lot. Shares have doubled this year after a 154% gain last year. That means pressure to outperform analyst expectations this week. But instead, they got a rare miss as the company's spending on new products and growth tempered profit. We caught up with Square CFO Sarah Fryer on Thursday. Great quarter, 60% top line growth. We're super impressed by that. Um, it's really speaking to our strategy of investing to grow. And so we think the right balance is with all the opportunity in front of us right now, we want to keep putting money back into the business. So we did beat on that top line with that 60% growth. On the bottom line, we want to invest, but also do it with financial discipline. Um, so we actually maintained our guidance for the full year. So 240 to 250 million of adjusted EBITDA. So that actually stayed the same. Um, that's, uh, you know, if you look at the back half of the year, that's three points of margin expansion. So we think that's the right balance of invest to grow, but do it with financial discipline. So shares have more than doubled now so far this year. What do you say to the investors who say that is just too rich, investors are expecting too much? And it comes back to what is the opportunity in front of the company. So we were really clear at the beginning of the year that we were focused on omnichannel, financial services, and international. Those are three massive opportunities for the company. And we keep adding to the product list that keeps opening up more and more addressable market. Um, so in my mind, you know, what we're focused on is how do we continue to grow a big, impactful company? How do we do more for our sellers uh, who are seeing buyers show up everywhere? How do we build now a big individual platform with Cash App? Um, and then finally, how do we take take all of this out onto a global stage. Give me some more specifics about where you see investing in the business and where you see the most returns as a result of those investments. Sure. So I'll actually start with Omnichannel. So one of the big mega trends in the world, right, are buyers are showing up everywhere. They're offline in your store, but they're online on your app. They could be in a marketplace, you name it. So as a seller, you need to make sure you can always make the sale. So one of the biggest investments for us has been how do we do that across every vertical? And we made a fairly large acquisition in Q2 of Weebly to continue to augment that. Um, second place we put a lot of investment into is Cash App, which is our individual platform for, for uh, consumers, frankly, to open up access to the financial system. Started with P2P, and now we keep adding more and more utility. The cash card itself uh, tripled in volume in just the first six months of the year. Um, so another big place for investment. We all want to talk about Bitcoin. How many customers have you added since you started buying and selling Bitcoin? Sure. So if you look at what Bitcoin is, it's another piece of utility in that cash app. So as I said, started with P2P, we added a card, you can keep a balance, you can add in now your paycheck, you can go to an ATM, and you can buy crypto. Um, we talked about 7 million monthly actives as of December, it was actually before we went live with crypto. We haven't given a new metric, but you can clearly see under the hood that there's real growth um, because we're a top 30 app in the app store. In fact, yesterday we were 15, we typically go even higher towards the end of the week. So that's rarefied air. Um, and that's a good way to really uh, monitor the growth that's going on in the platform. So you can buy, send, and sell Bitcoin right now. Why not let people receive Bitcoin? Is that something that you plan to do? Um, so again, it's about utility. We want to make sure, do people really need it today? And so by opening up just buy and sell, which we think is the easiest way to do it, I mean, it's literally a matter of seconds, and you can make that first Bitcoin purchase, we think that's the right first step from a Bitcoin perspective. And yet, obviously, the price is extremely volatile, and you generally generated almost as much Bitcoin revenue as you lost. You brought in about three million more than in the prior quarter. Jack Dorsey has said it doesn't just stop at buying and selling. So what are next steps? Yeah, so I think in utility in the Cash App, um, next steps for us there are what else do consumers want to be able to do when they start holding an account? Um, so a really new thing we launched was Boost. Um, Boost is effectively a rewards and loyalty program for, think about it as a prepaid debit card, really almost unheard of in the industry. Um, what Boost allows is a carousel for sellers to say, okay, I want to be able to drive buyers to my platform. And the buyer can look at it and say, hey, I really want that 15% off a Shake Shack burger, or I really want a dollar off my coffee, which is my preferred Boost. Um, and so these are just examples of how we really try to rethink what financial services looks like for individuals. What's the thing that's surprised you most since you started um, working in cryptocurrency? 
Um, on the crypto side, um, in terms of a surprise, I mean, just the fact that it's one of many pieces of utility that people want. It's not the be all and end all that I think we hear a lot on financial news. Rather, it's just like any other form of investing that people are making. Um, they want to have access, um, and that's what Square's purpose is. That was Square CFO Sarah Fryer. Up next, Naked Labs has created a product that might know your body better than you do. We'll take a look at how the company is bringing 3D scanning technology into the hall. This is Bloomberg. way beyond a normal scale. Startup Naked Labs has made a 3D body scanner with a full-length mirror that people can buy for their homes, the first of its kind. It delivers information on your body, including weight, height, BMI, measurements. The company just raised $14 million, led by the venture capital firm Founders Fund. We spoke with Cyan Bannister, one of the firm's more recent partners and an early Uber and SpaceX investor. Originally, the goal is to have it in every home. To begin with, you know, it's going to be the person who buys a Peloton um, who really cares a lot about personal fitness. And um, so the price point is higher uh, to start off with. Well, it's $1,300. Right. The scale is more like 20 right. but okay. So if you think of, like, <laughs> televisions when they first started out, they were $23,000 for the flat screen TVs. You know, if you're a pioneer in the space and someone who's an early adopter, you're paying more. But eventually we can drive the price down with scale. So how does the technology actually work? Uh, well, it has sensors that actually do depth reading, and so when you stand on the scale and you put your arms out, have you tried it? I haven't tried it oh, yet. I highly recommend I'll take trying one. it. Yeah, <laughs> highly recommend trying it. We'll try to hook you up with uh, with doing one. But you basically stand on a pedestal. The pedestal turns around, and then afterwards, in about a minute, you get what looks like a silver surfer um, image of yourself. That's a flattened out image, and uh, you're able to see a 3D model of yourself. So. Talk to me about the potential here, the kinds of information that this can give you and how it might change your life or how you live it. Well, you know, I think that we are scale obsessed and we're obsessed with numbers that don't really ultimately matter for your health. Um, so if you get on a scale and you're like, gosh, I'm two pounds heavier or five pounds heavier or 10 pounds heavier, but you're working out at the gym and you're making you know, dietary changes, are those changes that actually really matter? And so when you actually get a 3D body scan, you can see what those life choices are actually, how they're impacting your body. Like sometimes when you work out, you're gaining weight. And so you might become discouraged if you just got on the scale every day. What about the privacy issues here? I mean, we're so concerned, you know, especially in light of the Facebook data scandals, what companies know about it, about us, how they are using that data, if they're being honest about it, if they even know where our data has gone. Yeah, I, you know, Naked Labs takes that very seriously, and that's one of the reasons why all of the scans are done on device. Um, and then the only thing that so they... So it's stored there. It's it stored there on device, the does company. not go back to the company. The only thing that you get back to the company is that little silver server surfer image um, of yourself. So uh, you joined Founders Fund now a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and you were an angel investor before that. You backed Uber, you backed SpaceX. What do you think are the big mega trends right now? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I, I know what I'm personally passionate about. I don't know that I follow the market and try to figure out what the biggest trends are, but I'm personally very passionate about the future of entertainment. Mm -hmm. And so I've been doing a lot of investing in that area. And so I've been turning over rocks and basically, I don't know if you've heard of like Hatsune Miku, which is a virtual pop star and she's a hologram. Billions of people mm -hmm. watch her. Um, but also there's little Michaela on Instagram. She's a virtual influencer. Um, so I did a seed investment there. And so there's things that I'm like looking at and trying to figure out, okay, what is the next Pokemon Go? You know, how are we going to interface with our phones? How is augmented reality going to impact us? And so those are things I'm really excited you about. You invested in Uber. Do you think scooters are the next big thing or not I don't, so big? Personally, my personal opinion is no. <laughs> um, but I do think they are necessary for certain people. Like people are really happy about them and they're a cost effective, affordable way to get around town. Have to ask you about Elon since you invested in SpaceX. It's Tesla earnings day, uh, Founders Fund back Tesla. You know, does it concern you at all that this is, you know, he's running two companies. 
He's got a lot of side projects. He's tweeting all the time, including right now, minutes before the earnings call. Does that concern you as an investor from an execution perspective? Well, we're pretty bullish on Elon, as you know. <laughs> um, we're very proud of everything that he's accomplished. And yes, it is a lot to take on, but I think that he's you know, shown that he can do it. Um, but you know, I don't speak to Elon on a day-to-day -day basis, so I actually don't even know the breadth of everything he's doing. What about Bitcoin? Uh, Founders Fund has made big bets on cryptocurrency, um, which is, you know, it's actually been an unusual turn um, for, for, for venture in general. Do you think that, uh, are you still bullish and do you expect to make more investments there given the volatility in the price? I mean, I know everyone's excited about blockchain, but let's talk about the value. I think currency. as a team, we are still bullish. Um, personally, I'm also still bullish. Um, so I hodl. I don't know if you know the term, but I hold on for dear life. Um, as a store of value, I think it's incredibly valuable. It's basically digital gold. Um, it's not the best way to transact. And so I think there's going to be other types of currencies that are good for that in different infrastructures, but it's good for store value. So a lot was talked about when, when Peter Thiel backed Donald Trump and how that impacted others at the fund. And I'm curious if it's changed your experience at Founders Fund at all, if it's had a negative impact or changed the way that you guys do business or interact I, within the firm. You know, I think it made us closer at the firm, mostly because we like to celebrate diversity of thought and not everybody there agrees with everyone. You know, we have people you know, who voted for Bernie Sanders. We have people who voted for Trump. It's a very personal decision. And so it's one thing that we actually talk about a lot of things that have nothing to do with politics, like the future of the world and, you know, like what sort of exciting things we could be investing in. And so politics is very little to do with what we do. Um, but if anything, I think it made us stronger because we got to really know each other and collaborate with each other more. And, you know, and we had to be pretty, pretty strong. Have things changed since he moved to LA? We see him more actually. Really? So, yeah. So if you think about it, like his office was right next to ours. He could just walk over for an hour or so. Now he comes in and he's there for a full day or two. Um, and so we actually see him in the office more as a result of him being in LA, which is great. Now, uh, here in San Francisco, we're seeing increasing anti-tech policies like bans on the scooters, um, limits on the commuter buses and things like that. I saw you tweeting about the promise of a Silicon Valley in the Midwest. You know, why stay in San Francisco at all? I mean, Peter's in LA. Could you see the firm moving elsewhere? Or do you see potential elsewhere? And if so, where? I mean, it's always possible. We're not discussing it right now. But um, I do think that we have started looking outside of Silicon Valley for other possibilities. Like the next great company might not be in our backyard. And so we've looked at the Midwest. We're looking at Asia. We're looking all over the place. Um, and so we are no longer um, location specific. So we're sector agnostic, location agnostic, stage agnostic. Um, and so I think that's just you know, we're not going to stop investing here and we're not going to stop being here in the foreseeable future. Now, you know, I'm very interested in diversity issues. I know you've spoken out on them before as well. You're a self-taught engineer and entrepreneur. What do you think is missing from the conversation about diversity in Silicon Valley? Well, diversity is often sometimes things you don't see. It's sometimes not what's on the outside. It's like, for example, I identify as genderqueer. And by the way, thank you for asking about my pronouns. I think that was very inclusive and, and wonderful. So thank you. Um, but I think a lot of the times when we're having these discussions, we don't realize about there's neurological diversity. You know, so sometimes people will say things like that person is dense or whatever, and you know they're on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And there's things like that that I think uh, age diversity. You know, these are these are certain things I don't feel like we're having a lot of conversations about that also matter. Thanks to Cyan Bannister, partner at the Founders Fund. And that does it for this edition of the Best of Bloomberg Technology. We will bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. Tune in Tuesday when we check in with Etsy CEO Josh Silverman after the company reports earnings and get more clarity on the new digital tax bill. 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology. And be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.
Get the edge you need to stay ahead. Subscribe to Bloomberg Business Week and receive four bonus issues free. Bloomberg Business Week delivers in-depth reporting and provocative perspectives that take you inside the news each week. Bloomberg's 2,400 journalists worldwide dig deep for stories and insight you can't find anywhere else. Take advantage of this special offer. Order now to get four free bonus issues of the only business magazine powered by Bloomberg. Go to businessweekmag.com slash TV offer.